So last time we had finished up chapter 14. Uh, today we're going to start chapter 15. So word of warning, chapter 15 is a rather, um, it's a rather big chapter. So I think there's there's five lessons in there, but many of these lessons will be more than one day. Um, and then we'll probably do a little bit of stuff outside of the text, or outside of the lessons as well, as this is a topic that ideally we did in Algebra 2, but I know that we didn't. So we'll do this kind of carefully and a little bit more thoroughly for you guys now. Full disclosure, this tends to probably be the most difficult Algebra 2 topic that the traditional class does. So if you can put on your big boy math pants for today and the rest of this chapter, that'd be a good idea. Those of you guys that are seniors, um, we will not, you will not finish this chapter before you're kind of done. Um, so you'll be responsible for whatever we're able to get through in class on your exam or whatever if you have to take one. Um, and as that gets closer, we'll be super clear as to kind of what where that ends. Um, when we talk about the exam format and stuff, I'll be pretty clear on that for you. Um, everybody okay? All right. So chapter 15, we're going to be talking about exponential, logarithmic, and logistic functions and applications of those uh, things. We're going to start by talking about exponential functions. So an exponential function is something that we can write in the form f of x equals a times b to the x but we have a couple restrictions on that a cannot be 0 b cannot be 1 and b has to be non-negative I should say B has to be positive. We're not including zero there. So let's take a minute and think about why we have these three restrictions, why those things, why we'd want to include those. So what would happen if we allowed A to be zero? What would happen to our exponential function? What would happen if a was 0? There wouldn't be no solution. Audrey, did you say something? It just equals 0, right? Which is a constant function, type of polynomial, not what we want, right? OK. So what would happen if we allowed uh, b to be 1? What's 1 to any power? Just 1, right? Everybody agree with that? So what would f of x turn into if b was 1? a, right? Which is a constant function, not something we want. Everybody's OK with that? Why, what would happen if we allowed b to be negative? This one's a little harder to see why that's going to be a problem. Um, so let's say that our f of x is um, 
let's say one times two to the x. I'm sorry, uh, one times negative two to the x. If I do f of one, what am I gonna get? Negative two, right? If I do f of two, what am I going to get? Four, excellent. If I do f of three, what am I going to get? Negative eight. If I do f of four, what am I going to get? positive 16. What are you noticing here about my values? Well, they're not doubling. They're alternating between positive and negatives, right? That's pretty weird. Um, but that's really not the problem. What if I wanted to do f of 1 half? What is the exponent of 1 half the same as? Does anybody remember what the exponent of 1 half, what is that the same as doing? It's the same as a square root. What's the problem with this? Elise? Yeah, we're squirting a negative number, so that means we'd get like a non-real answer. Right? She can't take the square root of a negative without using an i. Everybody okay? And it turns out that any even root, the same thing would happen, whether it's a fourth root, a sixth root, an eighth root, a tenth root, that are all equivalent to a fractional exponent. So like, whether you remember this property of or not, an nth root is equal to the power of 1 over n. So a square root is 1 half, a cube root is 1 third, a fourth root is 1 fourth. Everybody's okay with that? So what would this mean if we allowed this? We'd have how many um, fractions have an even denominator? Infinitely many, right? How many numbers are between two fractions with an even denominator? Infinitely many that don't have an even denominator. How many even denominators are in between any two even denominators? Infinitely many. So we have some function now, or we'd have some function now that has infinitely many discontinuities, places where we have like a place where the function is undefined because it has a non-real answer. But in that same interval between any two of those, we have infinitely many discontinuities and infinitely many points that are defined. And this is now a mess, right? Like nothing in the real world is going to behave like this. We don't want to include this as something that can happen. Is everybody okay with why we're not allowing the b to be negative? Is we just get like something that you couldn't even draw on a sheet of paper. It's like just a mess. Just a mess. Um, a quick little piece of vocab. 
the value B is called the base of the exponential. The value for x is called the exponent. And a is a coefficient, or sometimes called the initial value. Any questions so far? Or just kind of introduced this new type of function. Talked about what its equation looks like, what the names for the parts are, and the restrictions we've placed on the parts of that function, the values that they can have. So every exponential function of the form f of x equals a times b to the x has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, which means that either the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x is equal to 0, or the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x is equal to zero. Those are equivalent statements saying the asymptote is equal to zero. And then at least one of these two limits needs to hold. Now, in general, for a horizontal asymptote, one of these limits would be fine. Could both of them hold? Yes. Will that happen for an exponential function? No. All right, let's talk about some simplifying or common mistakes that I see students make. If I do 2 times 5 to the x, can I write that as 10 to the x? What do we think? At least you say no. Why not? You're shaking your head quite vigorously. Good. So you're right. This is not true. Is there anything we can do to simplify this? There is not. 
Multiplying those two things together would be violating the order of operations because we know we have to do exponents before we do multiplication. Let's contrast that with what if we had the quantity 2 times 5 to the x. What's that equal to? That's 10 to the x. Okay, so the, where the parentheses is located definitely matters, right? In this previous example, you could think about the parentheses just being around the 5 and not around the 2 if you'd like. Not incorrect to think about it that way. What if I have 2 times 2 to the x? We've established that I can't write that as 4 to the x, right? But I can still do something to this. Anybody know what to do? Let me ask you this question. If I have x squared times x to the third, what do I get there? x to the fifth, because we've added the exponents, right? Well, I can think about this as 2 to the first times 2 to the x. So if I use that same rule, how would I write this one? Not x, 1 plus x, where that's all of that is in the numerant or the exponent. Does that feel okay? So far, so good, everybody. I'm trying to go through this slowly and carefully, reviewing some of these ideas that. Best case scenario, you feel real comfortable with from your Algebra 2 class. Worst case scenario, we're just going to do it here for the first time and really kind of get a little bit more comfortable with this. What if I have 2 to the x squared? How can I simplify that? Okay, so just like if I had x cubed squared, and that's x to the 2 times 3, or x to the 6th, we could write this as 2 to the 2x. Or, how else could we write this? Or I could write this as 4 to the x, because 2 times x is commutative. I could think about that as squaring first and then doing the exponent of x, or doing the exponent of x and then squaring second. It doesn't really matter. So, oops, I thought I hit the highlighter. Either of those would be appropriate ways to write that. about this. 
1 fourth times 2 to the x. What can I do with that? There is some simplifying we could do here. Okay, surely we can write 2 to the x over 4. Still more we can do with it, though. But there's nothing wrong with doing that. That's perfectly fine. Is there another way I might be able to rewrite 4 that would be helpful here? Four is the same as two squared, right? Why is that helpful to us? Now the bases of our exponential are the same. So what can we do? If I have like x to the fifth over x to the second, what does that turn into? x to the third. How'd you get the three? So what is this one going to be? Exactly. 2 to the x minus 2. Is this feel okay just reconnecting these exponent rules that have tend to drift this tends to be one of the things from algebra 2 that we are often the least confident with are these exponent rules um, but are like hugely important in this chapter to make sure you're not like just making a mockery out of doing anything the right way if you can't apply these rules correctly it begins Everything afterwards becomes just a mess to sort back out. What do you guys think? Um, so those were just some examples. Let's go ahead and recap our exponent rules. So if the bases are the same, and we multiply two things together with the same bases, we can add their exponents. If we multiply two things with different bases but the same exponent, We can multiply their bases the same, or together, and keep their exponent the same. And then the same thing is true for division. We should have the caveat that that number can't be 0. So we have the negative exponent property. We know negative exponent just makes a reciprocal. We have the zero exponent property. Any 
anything to the zero power is one, well, any non-zero number to the zero power is one. What's zero to the zero? It's not one. It's not zero. It's called indeterminate is what we say for that, which is different than undefined. Indeterminate is like you, I could cook up a couple of different problems that are all simplified to zero to the zero, but like could also simplify to something else like one, two, infinity, seven, negative one. Like it's literally like I could make this kind of a problem like this equal anything. That's what we mean by indeterminate. As opposed to like one over zero, which is always just infinity. Zero over zero is another indeterminate. So, um, and then what do we say? The last one, I guess we can put this in. So again, these are just recapping our exponent rules. Again, you would have talked about these ideally in your Algebra 2 course that look familiar. Okay, hopefully it does. Again, this is stuff that I would consider prior learning. Even if we didn't get to this chapter in Algebra 2, I would expect you have done this already in Algebra 2. Um, and if we make a mess out of these, like everything we're doing in this chapter is just going to get a lot harder, which is kind of why I'm taking a pause here and just kind of recapping these for us. Um, okay. So let's look at an example here. So let's say f of x is equal to negative 2 times 4 to the x. What am I going to get if I do f of 2? What does f of 2 tell me to do? I'm going to just take my equation for f of x and plug in 2, right? What does that equal? Should be able to do this kind of stuff with no calculator. Negative 32 is correct. Remember, we have to do the exponent first. 4 squared is 16. Negative 2 times 16 is negative 32. What about f of 0? What's that going to give us? Nope. Negative 2 is correct. 4 to the 0 is 1. Remember, any non-zero number to the 0 is 1. about f of negative 3? How do I do 4 to the negative third? It's not negative 64. It's not 64. It's 1 over 4 to the third. Now, 4 to the third is 64. So you were quite close there, Lucas. So the negative sign makes a reciprocal. And then we drop the negative. And what's negative 2 times 1 over 64? Negative 
1 over 32. Negative 1 over 32. I wrote the negative. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, we're just, okay. I'm just picking some stuff and we're evaluating, just practicing using these rules that I just kind of went over. Okay. It's mostly what this is about, just practice arbitrarily. Uh, F of one half. What does this become? What? What do you guys think? What's four to the one half? How'd you get two? Excellent. The one exponent of one half turns into a square root. How am I going to do 4 to the negative 3 halves? So when I look at this, what I see is 4 to negative 1 times 3 times 1 half. Instead of thinking about it as negative 3 halves, I'm going to think about it as three separate pieces. Is everybody okay with that? And with my exponent rules then, I can write this as like 4 to the negative 1 cubed to the 1 half, or I could write it 4 to the 1 half cubed to the negative 1, or I could write it as like 4 to the 3rd to the 1 half to the negative 1. There's like, you know, uh, whatever. There's six combinations that I could do this in, right? Um, of these, which, and, and again, it doesn't really matter the order, but which order is going to make it the easiest? Which of those exponents would I want to do first? The half, yeah, for sure, because, well, 4 to the 1 half is something I can do in my head. In fact, I just did it a minute ago. Then I'm going to do the cube, and then I'll flip it. So 4 to the 1 half is just 2. We did that up above, right? And then 2 to the 3rd is 8. And 8 to the negative 1 is 1 over 8. And negative 2 times 1 over 8 is negative 1 fourth. And none of that was too bad if you thought about it the right way, right? Easy to do the mental math. You just have to know how to chunk the problem up. Or at least pencil and paper math. That really, But no calculator is necessary to do this. This is all stuff that would definitely be doable without a calculator. And practicing these exponent rules, I find for students, is much easier numerically than it is like with a variable to start with and just turn it into like a mental math kind of problem. All right. So far so good.
Let's take a look at some other examples now. Of some different kinds of problems. So here it says the table below gives the values for an exponential function g of x, find the equation of the function, and then here's the table of values. So I'm told that the function I'm writing is an exponential function. So immediately I know that my answer is going to look like that. Everybody agree? Okay. So to answer this question, I need to figure out a value for A, and I need to figure out the value for B. That's what I need to figure out. Everybody feel good there? My answer, when I write it, should have a number for A and a number for B, but the G of X and the X would just be symbols. So of those four points that I'm given, which one of them is the most useful to me straight away? Negative 1, 3 fifths, 0, 3, 1, 5, 2, 75. Which one is the best one to start with? Yeah, 0, 3 is absolutely the one I'd want to start with. So when I plug 3 in for g of x, and I plug 0 in for x, I have this. Everybody's okay here? So what's b to the 0? Nope. It's 1. Well, hold on a second, Mr. Kulik. How do I know that B is non-zero, right? If something to the zero is equal to one, only if it's non-zero. How do I know that B is non-zero? Because it's an exponential function. Right? The requirements for an exponential function are that b can't equal 1 and has to be greater than 0. So it can't be 0. So I know that that's going to give me a 1. Pat. Absolutely. And as a result, then I know here that a is 3. Everybody feel good so far? Now... We're going to find the value for b. Which of these points is going to be most useful to do that? Or make this the easiest, really. I could use any of the other three points at this stage, but one of them is going to be the easiest. 1 and 15. So I have 15 is equal to 3, because I know my value for a, times b to the first. So all I need to do is divide both sides by 3, and I have my value for b. So if I put this all together now, g of x is equal to a times 3, I'm sorry, is 3 times 5 to the x. There's my answer. What's the immediate next question you would, should be asking? Anybody? What if I'm not given such convenient points? What if I'm not given x equals, or an x value that's zero, or an x equals, that's equal to one? What should I do then? Right? That's the next question. What if this is... That problem was quite easy because I already had my value for 
A basically for free, right? Well, I still know this is an exponential function. So I can still say this, and again, I know those three things along with that because it's exponential. I get all that stuff for free. Now this is less convenient, right? If I try to plug the first point in, I would write 48 equals a times b to the negative 3. And if I try to plug the second point in, I would write 12 equals a times b to the negative 1. And no matter which point I plug in, I still have two variables. What am I going to do here? Well, I'm going to just form a system of two equations, kind of like we did in supplement A. Now, this system that we've written here is different than all the systems we looked at in supplement A. Why is it different? Or what's different about it? What? Well, there's exponents, but there's exponents in the other one, too. Here's the issue, is that the variables in these problems are being multiplied or divided as opposed to being added or subtracted, right? The equations here are exponential as opposed to polynomial, which is what we looked at in the previous. Is everybody okay with that? So in the previous supplement A, what were the two main techniques we used to solve these systems? Do you remember the names for that? Anybody? Substitution and elimination. Great. We're going to use the same two techniques here. Um, my suggestion would be to use elimination in this situation. But elimination is going to work a little bit differently for this system than the systems in supplement A, because instead of the variables being added and subtracted to one another, our variables are multiplied or divided. So when we did elimination back in supplement A, to eliminate a variable, we just added or subtracted the two equations from one another, right? Because the variables were being added and subtracted. Since these variables are being multiplied and divided, which do you suppose we're going to be using to eliminate a variable? Multiplication or division. So I'm just going to take one of these equations and divide it by the other. It doesn't really matter which equation we divide by the other, but we can make our lives a lot easier if we're careful about which one we pick. I'm going to take equation B and divide it by equation A. The reason I'm going to do that is I want the bigger exponent to be the numerator of my division problem. That's going to make life easier for me. Everybody's OK with that reasoning? So when I divide B by A, I'll divide the left-hand sides together. So I'll have 12 divided by 48 is equal to, then I'll have the right-hand sides divided by each other, a times b to the negative 1 over a times b to the negative 3. Is everybody OK with how I wrote that? How do I reduce 12 over 48?
That's one fourth, right? How do I reduce a times b to the negative one divided by a times b to the negative three? Well, I can just cancel the a's, right? Everybody's cool with that? How do I reduce the b's though? Subtract them, great. So I'm gonna have negative one minus negative three. Oops, I wanted that to be red. So what is negative one minus a negative three? Okay, how am I going to cancel the squared on that B? How do I turn that B squared into just a B? Square root. Mm -hmm. What do I have to remember when I square root both sides of an equation? Plus or minus. What's the square root of one-fourth? How do we do the square root of a fraction? You just square root the top, which is one, and then we square root the bottom, which is two. But remember here, what do I know about the value for b? Specifically, it's got to be greater than zero. What does that allow me to do? Drop the minus from the plus or minus. Everybody feel good so far? So I know that b is 1 half. Now I can take that and plug it back into either of my two equations, equation A or equation B. Which one does it appear to be easier to plug into? I would plug it into equation B as well. The exponent is much nicer. What is one half to the negative one? How do I simplify that? What does a negative exponent do? Right, what does it do? Makes a reciprocal, right? That's all that's saying symbolically, just making a reciprocal. So what's one half to the negative one? Two, the reciprocal. And then as we divide by two, we get A equals six. So we put those together and I get six times one half to the x. Questions so far? We doing okay? Pace is good? Not going too fast? I'm trying hard to be like very careful and go at a very meaningful, purposeful pace. So this is, I know that a lot of this is new. Or potentially new anyways. Okay. So if I look at these previous two problems, I notice in problem, this most recent example, the base of my exponential is 1 half. And the previous one example, the base was 5. That makes it really difficult to compare these two functions if the bases for the exponential are different. 
it would be nice if there was a way to write our answers for both of these so that they had the same base, right? That would allow a very easy comparison. Is everybody okay with that? So it turns out there is a way to do that. The question would become then, well, what number do we use when we want to write these exponentials all with the same base? Well, that number is called the natural base. Or sometimes Euler's number. Now, this number is an irrational number, like pi. So much like pi, we don't write the number down because it's an infinite decimal that doesn't repeat. So there's no easy way to write that. We're going to use a symbol to represent that number, just like we do for pi. The symbol that we're going to use to represent this number is the letter E, the lowercase letter E. The way that we arrive at this number is the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over x to the x. So with where we're at, we can't evaluate this limit algebraically, symbolically, but we can approximate it numerically. We're just going to pick progressively bigger values for x and just kind of see what's happening, just like we've done before. So I'm going to just do this in Excel because it makes it kind of convenient. So one column are going to be my values for x. And the other column is going to be the values for 1 plus 1 over x to the x. And I'll just go and generate a bunch of values for this. What do you think? A thousand is probably sufficient. So if I look here, what do you notice about this number? Not changing a whole lot, is it? Right? It's really slowing down. So 271708, yada, yada, yada. At this point, what, it looks like we have five decimal points pretty settled, right? So that's our approximation here. If you looked at your graphing calculator, you notice that if I press second in the division symbol, that gives me the lowercase letter e. If I press enter, it's like, oh, there's that nest decimal. Or if I press second and the ln button here on the side, it'll give me the e with the exponent already built into it. So if I needed like e to the second, it saves me some buttons. I could always do though, second division and then do the caret and put the exponent on myself. It's fine to do it that way. Everybody's okay with where that's at on your calculator? Okay. 
Um, when we get a little bit further and we look at some applications, um, I'll show you kind of what the motivation is for choosing this as our value for E. But that'll come a little bit later and I'll do that like in context rather than now where it just seems we're just going to let it sit as like some arbitrary thing. Um, so with this new number E, we can update our exponential function definition. We can say it's a times b to the x, or we could write it as a times e to the kx. So here, when we had a times b to the x, we had the restrictions that a was not 0, b was not 1, and b was not negative. I should say b is positive. That's different than not negative, right? What's the difference? Not negative includes 0. So they are positive and not negative are different by one number, but it's an important number. Uh, here, we fixed our b to really be e and replaced or added this extra component in the, new, in the exponent k. There is a restriction we have to place on k though. What is that restriction got to be? Uh, k cannot be 0. Why is that going to be a problem? Because that'll just turn into e to the 0, which is just 1, and then we're back to a constant function, right? Okay. So, um, We have two different definitions for our exponential functions now, right? We have one that involves a and b, another one that involves a and k, right? Um, what do, regardless of whichever type of way we want to write our exponential function, we can divide our exponential functions into two types. We can call them exponential growth and then exponential decay. So let's just look at an example here. This is where I fixed A to be 1 and B to be 2. If I graph this, so here's the picture of my exponential function. Notice the horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. As I read my graph from left to right, is my graph increasing or decreasing? Is it getting bigger or smaller? as I read it from left to right. Is it growing or shrinking? Uh, 
Are you walking uphill or downhill? If you walk along the graph. What do you say? It's increasing. That would mean this is exponential growth. So when the A is positive and the B is bigger than 1, that was growth. What if we change our B to be a fraction? What happens now? It's now decreasing, right? That would we call that exponential decay. What if I oops, what if I decide to make the a value negative but I keep the v value less than 1? What would we say this one is? Growth or decay? Well, look at it. It's getting bigger as we go from left to right. This is growth still, although it's pretty wimpy growth because the growth is bounded by, um, oops, that's not what I want to put this. Oh, yeah, that is what I was putting this. Okay. And then... If I go and I do, do. So this is A is negative and B is bigger than 1. What do I have going on here? Growth or decay? It's decay, right? As we move from left to right, it's going down. Okay, so here let's do the other one. I'm going to fix a to be 1 and k to be 1. And then let's take a look at this one. What's this, growth or decay? Growth. And what do you suppose is going to happen if I make that k negative 1 now? Any guesses? What's that one? Decay. What do you think is going to happen if I make the a negative, but the k also negative. That'll be growth. The a is negative, but the k is positive. That'll be decay. Right? Growth And decay. Everybody feel okay with that? So this is just like some vocabulary basically just classifying what this is what will the picture kind of look like from the graph or from the equation. All right. Let's do another example.
given that the population of a certain city is in 1990 is 782,248 people and the population of the same city in 2000 is 895,193 and assuming that the population growth is exponential in what year will the population reach 1 million? So when I read this, I'm going to think about this as a two-step problem. Step one, I'm going to want to write some model to describe the situation. I'll call that model f of x. And in step two then, it's going to solve the equation for when that model is equal to 1 million. Everybody's okay with that plan? All right. So let's start with step one. Because we've got to have that, val or that function f of x first. We're told the population growth is exponential. So it doesn't matter which one I choose to use, but I'm going to be using one or the other. I know that because I'm told that the population is, growth is exponential. I'm going to just choose to use the first one. I think it'll make this problem easier given the numbers involved, or less messy anyways. Um, so it says that the population of the city in 1990 is 782,248 people. What is that really telling us? Well, that's like an x and an f of x, right? So the, x, the independent variable is the year, and the dependent variable is the population. So I can use those like that, right? So this problem now all of a sudden is turned into something very similar to this example three, right? What was the, what was the pain about example three though? And you have a point where the independent variable, the x, was equal to zero, right? The problem before that, where I did have that situation, was a little bit easier. Can I do that, do something to this problem to make it into the previous example that was easier to do? Yes. I'm just going to define a new variable t to represent the years after 1990. So what does that first point going to become then? What's my value for t? So the original point was 1990, comma, 
782,248. That was x comma f of x. My value for t then would be zero, right? There's zero years after 1990 and 1990. And what does 2,000 then turn into? 10. Oops. Put a little smiley face there, because boy, I outsmarted them this time. So if I use this point now, I can say that f of t is equal to a times b to the t or a is 782,248. I can then use the second point along with my answer for a to say that um, f of t is equal to a times b to the tenth. And I can use that now to solve for b. To do that, I would divide both sides by 782,000. So 8951193 divided by 782248. And then how am I going to get rid of the tenth power on the b? Well, it's going to cancel out that exponent of 10 attached to the b. Well, what if it was b squared? What would cancel out the squared? Come on, guys, girls, you know the answer to this. Help me out. It's been like pulling teeth all day on you guys. How am I going to get rid of the 10 on the B? How would I get rid of a squared? If it was just B squared, what would I do? Square root, right? How am I going to get rid of a 10 then? 10th root, right? Now, technically, there's a plus or minus here. But since it's a value of b, I know that it has to just be a, the positive. How do I do a 10th root on my calculator? Type 10, press the math button. Choose option 5, and then use that previous answer. So there's my ant or my model. In step two, then I want to solve that model equal to one million. Do we algebraically know how to do this yet? How do I get a variable out of an exponent? We don't know how to do that yet. We will by the end of this chapter, but we don't yet. What should I do instead then? I'm just going to graph the two sides of this equation. 
and find the intersection. So one side is going to be 1 million. The other side is going to be 782 248 times. And then I stored that number into A so I didn't have to type it in a bunch of times to the X. My window, my value for T is going to be the years after 1990. I don't know how long it's going to take to get to a million, but I know it's going to be more than 10 because at 10 it was only at 895,000. So I'm just going to really overshoot and pick um, 100. The Y minimum population is the initial 782. So I'll just do like 750,000. I know I need to get at least to a million, so I'll do like a million and a quarter. And go buy like hundred thousands. So there's my one million line. There's my model. This is the point that I'm interested in, the intersection. So second trace, intersect command. I just need to press enter three times. So T is about 18.2. What does that mean though? Remember T is the years after 1990. Bye, dudes.